Welcome to the Mother Earth News and Friends podcast. Do you want to take a next step in your gardening endeavors? We have a guest this episode who's here to help. Kenny Coogan chats with Karina Pope, who'll be sharing all about how to monetize your small-scale garden operations. This is Mother Earth News. This podcast is sponsored by Sun Glow Greenhouses, allowing you to truly garden for four seasons and maximize your ability to monetize your garden. For more than 40 years, Sun Glow has been making the most durable and energy efficient greenhouses on the market, allowing you to garden even in the coldest winters. Just ask their customers in Alaska, Minnesota, Wisconsin, really anywhere that gets below freezing in winter. Enjoy gardening in all four seasons, the Sun Glow way. Check them out at sunglowgreenhouses.com. That's S U N. G-L-O greenhouses.com. Good day, everyone, and we appreciate you for joining us on another exciting Mother Earth News and Friends podcast. I am Kenny Coogan, and joining me today is Karina Pope, eco-entrepreneur, garden educator, and farmer. At Mother Earth News for 50 years and counting, we have been dedicated to conserving our planet's natural resources while helping you conserve your financial resources. Today, we are going to discuss how to monetize small-scale gardening operations. Karina Polk is known for her pioneering work in translating edible gardens into a viable business model for transforming communities while also reducing chronic diseases in underserved food desert neighborhoods. Welcome to the podcast, Karina. Thank you so much for having me. I am super excited about being a part of such a wonderful program. The impact that you all are having on the field of horticulture, farming, gardening, hats off. And so I am super honored just to be a part of this. And we are honored to have you. And today we're going to be talking about making money on a small scale uh, garden. But first, I wanted to ask how you got started. I know over 10 years ago, you began designing your first community garden with then head coach of the Memphis Grizzlies, Lionel Hollins, United Healthcare, and the NBA Memphis Grizzlies. So how did that transpire and what did you learn from that experience? So I have a consulting firm, Urban Philanthropy by KP, and that consulting firm works with high profile or high net worth individuals to give back to the community in some sort of impactful way. So Lionel and I were having a conversation about how he could impact the community in a long lasting way. He said, hey, I wanna build a garden. I was like, a garden? I don't garden, you don't garden. Why are we building a garden? So he was right spot on that it was going to have a lasting effect. And so at that time, I did not have any gardening experience and I was able to build raised garden beds. And we pretty much were able to do that at no cost to him because we engaged so many partners. Our partners were Sam's, Walmart, the NBA. We had this worm guy, Jim, the worm guy, I think his name was, he donated compost. Everybody in the community, we even had a company that donated brick to have uh, all raised, the raised beds were completely brick and they were about three feet high. So we just engaged community partners. And the turning point for me was when the community center, now this is built in a low income area in Memphis, Tennessee with, at the time they were called Youth Visions, but they've turned their name to Leadership Empowerment Center. We built it on their facility. They engaged the kids. The kids loved to cook. They were gardening. They were producing a lot of food. And so I said, hey, you are producing food. Let's get you in a farmer's market. I contacted the local farmer's market and the farmer's market decided to donate space for them to go in there and sell their produce. The kids were excited. They were all on board. And once they did that, they had a small business. So my wheels got to turning and I was like, I can replicate this over and over and over again. And so after they were making money, they came up with a name, 
a bank decided to donate a thousand dollars for them to start a small business account. So it just one thing led to another. After they opened a bank account, I engaged the local culinary art school. They agreed to send students over once a month to cook with the kids with the ingredients from the garden. I just called them and told them what was in the garden, what we were growing. They then came up with recipes and they came to cook with the kids and their families. So for me, it was impacting the community. It was long lasting. It was changing the health of the people in that community. And so I just wanted to do it over and over and over again. And then that's how Let Us Live started. Very good. So before we talk about that, I want to go back to those community partners, because you mentioned so many like big names, but also community nonprofits organizations. So I was wondering, is it an easy sale to say, hey, I want to have a community garden? Because I imagine these businesses are getting a lot of queries from lots of different people saying, hey, can you donate for a playground? Can you donate for a basketball camp? Can you donate for you know, non-agriculture thing. So do you have like a go-to hook or? Yes, I am so glad you asked that question. That is the perfect question. And that is what you need to know when you're starting your small scale garden or farm or business. You need to know what is the other person interested in. If it's just self-serving, it's going to be very difficult to engage partners. So we, let's talk about United Healthcare specifically. We knew that they were interested in being in, having a presence in the low income community and they were interested in changing their health outcomes because of diabetes, high blood pressures. So we knew that they were interested in changing that community. We started by Who is interested in the work that we're doing? Who's doing something similar, but needs a partner? So you really have to be my hook or my, the way I'm able to get partners like Amazon, Aetna Healthcare, the way I'm able to get those partners is looking at their mission statement or looking at what they're interested in, in the season that you want to approach them. So are you looking for a seed company, let's just suppose that. Are they looking to partner more with, uh, if you're looking at their branding, their mission statement, are they looking to partner with minorities? Are they looking to get seeds out to low-income communities or rural areas? Look at what they're, look at what the company that you're interested in partnering with, you have to know their mission statement because they want to know that the, the relationship is going to be beneficial to both parties. Very good. I was a agriculture teacher for seven years and I averaged about $10,000 in in-kind donations like seeds and bricks and raised beds and things like that. Half of that time I worked at a low income school, public school. And then the other half of the time I also worked at a public school but it was more of a affluent community. And Mm -hmm. I don't want listeners to be dissuaded because some seed companies, their mission is for kids. So they don't care. Low income, affluent, it's just kids. We want to get kids because the reality of it is most companies that are interested in children, they really want kids to be more active. They want to get them outside. They want, they want to see that they're physically engaged. So yes, it's not always just low income. It's children or it's women or it's, you know, farmers, small scale farmers. You you really have to find out what it is they are really looking for. And then you kind of tweak your pitch or your proposal based upon their needs or their interest. All right. So you alluded to that you formed the Let Us Live Urban Farm Project. So can you talk about what that mission is and what are some of the things you've accomplished? Yes. And and this is what I'm glad you asked me that also, because what our mission was when we first started is not the same now. When I first started, my mission really was to uh, work with underserved areas and get them to grow their own food. Now, my mission is to inspire more people to grow their food. It's everybody because the 
health disparities and the negative health impacts, it's across the board, affluent, poor, middle-class people are, for one, not aware of where their food comes from. They have no clue. Two, the foods that we are eating, just for example, today, I went to go buy a can of beans because I wanted to make a veggie burger. It had an ingredient in there that said it was used to thicken, thicken or solidify. And I'm like, what do you, why do you need to thicken beans? And then the other ingredient was something to keep the color of the bean. Do I want to eat all of them, the chemicals? And I was like, I, I can't do this. And so those, a little bit of that, even eating healthy, because I am hearing stories about people saying, well, I'm eating healthy. I'm making right food choices. I'm trying to eat more vegetables. And I feel the same. My, my health outcomes are the same. You have to start looking at those ingredients or you have to start growing your own food. And that's right. I was reminded that I just came back from a, a plant trip, a plant conference in Japan. And during the conference, they had four tables of snacks spread out. So in between presentations, you could, you know, munch on things. And I was looking at the back of everything and just seeing, you know, some of them had squid, some of them had fish, da, da. and a lot of Europeans at the conference go, well, you know, in America, your Skittles and M&Ms are dyed with different things than they are in the rest of the world. So if you buy or if you eat a red Skittle in France, it's colored differently than in the U.S. because Europeans or other parts of the world say, oh, this food coloring is not safe. So what are we doing with still eating these unsafe things in the U.S.? It is so true. Every other, and let's back up. Why did you go to Japan without me? That's what I want to know. Um, <laughs> So other parts of the world, they do not approve half of the chemicals. I, I, I think I saw a list. There are over at least 300 chemicals that are legal here in the United States that aren't legal somewhere else. I get it. We have become lazy. We want convenience and we want pretty. And if you're doing organic, it's not always going to be pretty. It may have a line on it. It may have a bruise on it. And a lot of people are afraid of eating. I find this very interesting. And let me know if you do too. They're afraid to eat something bruised, <laughs> but they're not afraid to think about the chemicals. And they're not afraid to look at bag. the back of something yeah, that has exactly. all the list of stuff. And they'll eat it, but they won't eat a bruised fruit. It's the weirdest thing. I have a master's degree in global sustainability with an emphasis on food sustainability and safety and uh, bruised and non-perfect produce was definitely a big emphasis about we really need to embrace the imperfect in the garden. Absolutely, because it's fruits and vegetables the same. Humans aren't perfect. Food's not going to be perfect. And why would you want to eat anything a bug would not eat? If a bug won't eat it, you probably want to steer away from it. Yes. So your urban farm project, Let Us Live, has been around for about 10 years. And I know you just shared the mission. So can you just kind of further explain, do you now have one physical site or do you have many sites? And how are you engaging the students? So we have multiple sites, again, because my goal and mission is to inspire more people to grow the foods they love to eat, I'm doing more consulting. I manage a community garden in Missouri City. That primarily attracts high school students who need a lot of volunteer hours. And so that's primarily where our bank of kids come from. And today, as a matter of fact, earlier today, we were there with the Fort Bend Council and we had about 30 kids out there. So there, and they were high school. So primarily the community garden is high school, but I focus now on consulting. I'm going to people's homes. I'm doing online workshops. Garden Made Easy is one of our workshops because I always say, you don't have to have a green thumb or a, black, a brown thumb. You do not. The most important thing is starting with the good foundation, which is good soil. I teach that to our clients. 
we focus on going either, like I said, to their home, we're doing consultations, we're installing custom design beds or prefab beds, but we are mainly doing consulting and online workshops because what I figured out was I can reach more people if I'm doing it online. If I'm doing these workshops online, I can inspire more people. I have a larger reach. Now we do have clients. We have a couple of clients that have restaurants and they have gardens. They're doing the farm to table experience, which I love. And then I also do horticulture therapy. If I could do something for the rest of my life and not get paid for it, it would be horticulture therapy. Perfect. It so my, my, my next soul. question is on your website, you say that horticultural therapy is said to have gotten its start from ancient Egypt physicians. So what aspects of health do you see garden therapy improving in the people that you work with? So currently we work with clients that are in, they're in transition from some sort of addiction. Specifically in that environment, we help them see the connection between the plants and the human lives. Oftentimes, just getting them to get out of their comfort zone and get into the garden. I don't want to touch the dirt. I don't touch dirt. I don't do things outside. But once they get outside and they lose their self in time, either if they're watering, they're, they're, they're calming themselves down, they're connecting with nature, and they are at peace. It's a beautiful thing. It, I've seen so many clients that have never gardened, have no interest. But then on the flip side of that, they've lost through their addiction, they've lost connection with their family, their parents. And I hear so many times, my grandmother used to garden. This brings back memories. Uh, my mother used to garden. When I get out of the facility, I'm going to start a garden. And so again, it's bringing that family bond back together. There's so much research behind if kids are growing their own food, they're more likely to consume more fruits and vegetables. I've been on a plant-based diet for over 20 years. And I'm going to tell you that that is absolutely true. Because once I started growing my own food, I had a wider variety of fruits and vegetables that I would eat and try. I had never beans and peas. I tried purple whole peas. I never tried purple whole peas until I grew them. And let me tell you something. I love purple whole peas. I'm growing them all the time. I had never had raw okra until I started growing them. I prefer raw okra over cooked okra. Fresh okra from the, from the garden is delicious. I don't eat on a plant-based diet. I will not eat tomatoes in public. Why? <laughs> because they are mushy. They taste like water. They have no taste. So I never have tomatoes in public. However, I'm eating them and picking them in the garden all the time. The connection between food and our health, we see it time and time again. But for our clients that are in some sort of recovery for addiction or any sort of recovery, I tell the clients all the time, all of us are recovering from something, childhood trauma, broken heart, everybody's recovering from something. And just to go outside and be grounded. One thing that I do just about every morning is the first thing that I do is go sit outside. That's the first thing that I do. It you don't go me. on your, you don't go on your phone and look at social media as soon as you wake up. No, you know what I've started doing? I'm glad you mentioned that. And because of the health impacts of the phone and the radiation and all of that stuff, at nighttime now, I turn my phone off and I do not turn the phone on until I have done my morning ritual. And part of my morning ritual is sitting outside. I do not turn on the phone. Really, I don't turn on the phone until about 10 or 10.30. That's a great life advice that you just heard from Mother yes, Earth News and Friends podcast. Disconnect, wanna, you guys. Yeah, that garden therapy, that's really great for mindfulness, the sociality for those members, but also, you know, the physicality, they're moving, they're yes, bending, they're, they're stretching. I want to go back yeah. to you eating okra. 
Do you think the reason why we're not eating raw okra is because of the cultivars or the age of harvest that are usually available at the grocery store? Or do you find just fresh okra raw is good pretty much all the time? I don't think, and I, I'm going to tell you just based upon my experience, it was not something I knew you could do. Okay. I only had okra cooked. A lot of people either like okra or absolutely hate it because of the slime. Now, the other thing that I, I've learned over time, and because again, I'm taking vegetables from my garden and I'm cooking them myself. One of the things that I've learned is that you don't put the okra in your stew or anything that you're cooking until it's finished. So you let the stew cook or your gumbo cook or whatever you're cooking, saute tomatoes, let it cook. And when it's finished, you chop up your okra and then you put it in and you put the top on it and let the heat cook it. It's not slimy at that part, at that point for people that don't like the slime. Now there are some cultures that love the draw, that love that slime. I like it. I just did not know that you could eat okra raw. And so I just happened to be out in the garden one day and I was like, let me try this. And I was like, whoa, it was nice, crunchy. It was a crisp crunch. And I just think that most people hadn't don't know it. Now, I wouldn't do that in the grocery store because most of the time in the grocery store, it's frozen and unthawed. It's not fresh. I don't think it'll be good cold. It's just like you need a room temperature straight off the stock. It's delicious. You all try it and hit me up and let me know how it tastes. <laughs> That's great. And if you're listening to the podcast, you can go to our show notes to find out how to contact Karina and follow her. So I was thinking, because I've also eaten okra raw, that when you get those like really mature pods, those are woody and those wouldn't be the best eats raw. Agreed. Totally. So the trick with the okra, other than almost having to pick it every day, is kind of like squeezing it. So if you squeeze it and it has some give, then it's good. Once you squeeze it and it has no give, like it's hard, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't have any buoyancy, then that's past the mature stage. With anything in gardening, you have to know the variety that you're growing because you could say, somebody could say, oh, once it's past, you know, six inches or 12 inches, don't, it's terrible. But depending on the variety, it depends on what, how long you want it to grow. Now I like growing and I can't think of the variety name, but have you had that purple okra? The okra that has, it's purple. That particular okra, the reason I like that, it tastes great, but the other reason I like it is because I can harvest it a little bit later. Like if anybody that is growing okra knows it's like something you have to grow, excuse me, harvest every night. Can you imagine your kids growing as fast as okra? <laughs> that would be that would be scary. I mean, okra, you literally have to pick it every day. If you the purple ones you can harvest a little bit later. You can harvest it two or three days later. And if it has some length on it, it's okay. It still has some give, which is usually it's not woody. But if you squeeze it and it's hard, it's woody and you do not want to cook it. Good tip. So earlier you were mentioning farm to table experiences. And as a thought leader and passionate advocate for reforming the food industry, a couple of years ago, you formed the Black Growers Association to make the farm-to-table experience more profitable for Black and brown growers. So how does your platform help them to become more profitable? So we house and connect them. We remove the third party. So we connect them directly with people that want to buy either specifically from Black and brown farmers. There's a lot of initiatives now where people are focusing on supporting Black and brown farmers, realizing the disadvantages that they've had over the years. We kind of remove that obstacle by connecting them with people that want to buy restaurants, grocery stores, chefs that want to connect directly with Black, black and brown growers. And we're kind of in our infancy, infancy stage. We have found that a number of older farmers don't have platforms. They're not used to marketing. And sometimes that's where the disadvantage is. And so we help them in that area. So our platform really is saying, hey, we're cutting out the middleman, but we want you all to connect here 
you kind of build the relationship according to the way you see it individually. Now, before we can make money from a garden, I imagine we must plant one. So what are some important initial steps of starting the garden or the making money of a garden? The first thing, and I think oftentimes when I talk to clients and in our workshops like Garden Made Easier, our Garden Masterclass workshop, I always am surprised that people don't consider trees when they're gardening. So like you'll build a garden, but you build it right under an oak tree in the wintertime. And then in the summertime, you're like, my garden isn't growing. Well, it's under a lot of shade. So that's the first thing is really just laying out and doing a long-term outlook, doing a long-term outlook, because then you also have to consider where you're building your garden. Do you have young children? We had a client that had a pool. She had a couple, she had two young children and she had a couple of dogs. She had a very small space. The pool took up three fourths of her backyard and she wanted to put a garden in. I'm all for gardening, but then it's like, where are your dog and your kids going to play? You could say, well, they'll go around it, but you're creating obstacle and obstacles and possible unnecessary tension. In that case, you may want to instead of going out horizontally is do something vertically and it may not be as big as you want it. But I think the first thing you have to do is look long-term and look at the size that you think you want and then say, how much time do I really have to put into it? Because there's this new phenomenon. I don't know if you're paying attention to this, but I think it's absolutely... Unfortunately, I think it's hilarious, but it's sad. So the there are so many gardeners on Instagram and TikTok. They're building these big gardens every week. They're adding more space and more space and they're doing big, big, big. And then they realize, oh, I have to weed this. I've got to water this. I have, oh, I can't harvest this. I'm growing so much. Be realistic, because if you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, honey, you will begin to hate gardening. I think you really have to be realistic on how much time you have and you want to put in it before you become angry and bitter with the garden. And then see if if you're saying you're going to include your family. Realistically, how much time are they going to give to help you? So I think planning is the biggest thing, is projecting where you want to grow, grow away from trees. And then I always say out of sight, out of mind. If your garden, I don't know, where are you located? I'm in Tampa, Florida. Oh, Tampa. Okay. I'm in Houston and the summers are brutal. If you are gardening and your garden is 55, you know, steps away from your house, In the heat of the day, or you're going to find every excuse in the wintertime, you're not going to want to walk back that far. So I say it needs to be where foot traffic is. You need it needs to go be located close and within view of where there's already natural activity because you don't want to forget about it. But then if the point is to harvest and use the food, you want to put it in pro- close proximity to your back door, your kitchen window. So if you're cooking, I do this all the time. I'm running outside, I'm grabbing some herbs and I'm coming back in but if I have to go through mud and go all the way through the back and go through some trees and all of that yeah all of that it makes it difficult and it provides more excuses for you not to use it so think about convenience think about an eye view where you see it so you can remember to water it on the super hot days or cover it when it's really cold in the winter so in within eye view and I again say planning it you really want to take the time to plan what it looks like long term and also consider the amount of time that you have to give. And that's some of the things that we talk about in our Garden Made Easy workshop is like gardening sounds great, but how much time do you really have to give? Do you want to spend the time? Yes, weeding is important 
is a part of gardening. But if you do it right, you will rarely have to weed. And the other misconception I hear all the time is that they think gardens look messy. They don't have to look messy and woody and eyesight to the community. Great tips. I just wanted to add that at my house, I do have a little French garden, like a potager garden, where mm -hmm. I'm also in between preparing the meal. I'm like, oh, I have rosemary outside. Now I come back. Like, oh, I have chives outside. Oh, I'll grab five green beans or long beans or, you know, and it's great that it's close to the kitchen. It makes sense. Yes, Save you those want steps. it convenient. All right, we're going to take a quick break in our conversation to hear a word from our sponsor. And when we return, we will learn all about monetizing a small scale operation. For more than 40 years, Sun Glow greenhouses have survived tornadoes, hurricanes, hailstorms, and much more. An investment in a Sun Glow is a lifelong investment in quality produce. Just ask their customers in New England, Washington, Virginia, and Colorado. Really, anywhere that gets below freezing in winter. What makes SunGlow unique is their extremely durable aluminum frame designed by Boeing engineers and their long-lasting two-layer acrylic walls that offer high insulation values and more natural light for better plant growth over other greenhouses. Learn more at sunglowgreenhouses.com that's S-U-N-G-L-O greenhouses.com. And now back to our conversation with Karina Polk. We are back with Karina Polk, master gardener and founder of Let Us Live, an urban farm project. Now on uh, Mother Earth News Instagram, Learn With Smith asks, what is the best way to monetize? Would it be through farmers markets? So Karina, what do you think about farmers markets? And this is a audio only podcast, but Karina is shaking her head. <laughs> you all, let me tell you, farmers market is not the most economical way for a gardener. If you have products that you are selling like sauces or like we have garden sleeves and t-shirts, you can make a little bit more money, but if you're talking about selling vegetables, it is a little time consuming. Let me give you an idea of what the day looks like. And I'm, let me back up by saying, I'm not saying don't do farmer's markets because you do get your brand out and people get to know you that way. But I want you to know that it is, it's not a heavy money making machine. It's not so the best Return it's on not the best use of your time if if you're talking about scaling financially. So you let's let's say the day of a, a farmer's market, you have to harvest your 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 vegetables. You've got to wash, clean them, prep them. Then you have to load your vegetables on your vehicle. You've got to load your equipment on your vehicle. You then have to drive to the farmer's market. After you get to the farmer's market, you have to set up everything. After you're there, what, three to four hours, most farmer's markets, they're not even that long, but let's say they're four hours. Let's say you're at a farmer's market, four hours. You're at your farmer's market, four hours. Side note, this is why you really should not negotiate or try to undervalue farmers because all of this goes into arriving to the farmer's market. You you then you you have your four hours. You're selling your vegetables and anything that you don't sell, you can't go put it back in the ground. You have to find a way to move it. You have to be able to sell it somewhere else. And so, farmers markets. And then let's after the farmers markets over. I, I apologize. After the farmers markets over, you have to load all of your stuff up in the car, take it back to your farm or garden, unload all of that stuff and then go home or then it's, it's, it's an all day thing. And so I always say pay farmers what they're asking because it's hard work. So farming, farmer's market is not the most um, profitable way to be in the garden business. Now, I do think it's important to one, get your brand out introduce new products and if you're if you have products like sauces pepper honey 
things like that, jams, that's a great way if you're selling produce and another product. But if you're just selling produce, it is, unless you just want to spend your Saturdays or Sundays hanging out at the market with people, is not that financially rewarding. Are there specific crops that would do better at being monetized? I guess if watermelons do pretty well, watermelons do well, tomatoes, it, when you're getting a lot of tomatoes, they do well. Those are some products that people really don't negotiate a whole lot on. Things like okra, because it, they're heavy producers, that it, that would be also something that I think, I think okra, melons, because I'll, I'll pay 10 or $12 for a melon. If it's a good melon, I, I, I easily would pay 10 or $12 for it. Herbs do you, also. Do you think people are at a farmer's market or you'll talk about other ways that you can sell the produce, but are people really into purple okra and purple beans and peas and different colors of carrots and stuff? No, I find that if you're not a chef or you just aren't interested, if you don't have an interest in cooking and trying recipes, it it's the funniest thing when I say, oh, I have purple okra. And they were like, oh, no, I just want the green okra. I was like, <laughs> when you cook it, it turns green. No, I don't want that okra. It no, it's hard. Purple carrots. It it's hard to sell it. People are. I don't find that people are eating those specialty items. You have to go to like a farm to table and find a chef that really can value that, or somebody that cooks at home and likes to try different things. So no, the specialty crops. There's a learning curve you have to educate people on the pro on the yep. on the product or the produce. I remember a farmer's market I visited where it was the end of the market. Everybody had everything sold. And then this one uh, person in their booth, what they had left was the Romanesco broccoli that's like really triangular. And it was beautiful. It was green and white and purple. But it looked like they didn't sell any of it because people probably thought it was just ornamental or they didn't know how to incorporate it. Right. And so when you talk about growing things or selling something, are people familiar with it or are you going to have to spend a season on educating people that you have to ask yourself? And that's okay, but realize that you may have to spend marketing time on educating people on a particular product that you may be selling. All right, let's get to the specifics of how we can make money with a small garden. How small are we talking? What uh, size garden do you think we could have to start turning a profit? So when I started Let Us Live, I was in a townhouse with a very small backyard. I had one container that I... I pulled up my shrubs and I dropped a horse watering trough, a 40 gallon horse, horse watering trough, but it was circle. So it really wasn't that wide. So I had one container and I had a few flower pots and I was able to make money, but it wasn't just on the produce. The produce, a lot of it, I was giving it away or I initially was giving it away to my neighbors so that they could go tell other people and then bring, so people would start buying it or my neighbors would get some great tomatoes or cilantro and then they were like, oh yeah, this is different. This is great. So initially I was giving some produce away, but the way I start with Let Us Live and I find found to be profitable was, well, let me back up. What I realized is I had to make Let Us Live profitable and it wasn't through the vegetables. I realized that the vegetables were not going to make, weren't going to allow me to retire and sit um, on the beach or, you know, fly around the world. So I st had to start do introducing products and services so again, like I mentioned, our workshops, that is a way, you don't have to have a large garden for that. But what you do 
for people to trust your voice and trust what you're doing or teaching them, you have to be doing it. And so the garden, having the garden gives you the experience around your gardening and so people can see you. So we did workshops and then we started creating t-shirts and garden sticks and garden sleeves. So, and loofahs, now that's a good, that those sell well. Loofahs do well because we would cut them up. When we did go to these holiday markets or something special, like these one-offs, I would make salt baths, uh, salt scrubs with loofahs inside of them. And loofahs, I, I have to tell you all this funny story. So I live in a townhouse and there's a fence. I planted loofahs on, on, this is the first year I grew loofahs. Didn't realize they were wild. I planted loofahs on the fence line. I had so many loofahs that they were starting to grow up to the second floor of my townhouse. And then they looped over on my neighbor's fence fence luckily my neighbor didn't give me a hard time and they didn't care what I did was just give them some loofahs in exchange for allowing me to let them kind of loop over and grow over their fence so loofahs are twofold you can sell them as a zucchini with an edible zucchini you can eat them when they're small that's the note I just wrote down I was going to ask you if you've eaten them small Yes. Yeah, so the key about zucchini, zucchini excuse me, loofah, because they're in the same family. The key with the loofah is they need to have some give. Once they get too big, they're going to be more fibrous. And if you need fiber in your diet, I don't know, try it. Eat the sponge. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> eat the sponge. So loofahs are twofold. You can get them small and sell the zucchini. You could sell the flour because chefs the flowers are edible and chefs enjoy the flowers and then you can let them grow to the bigger size and sell the loofahs the loofahs instead of selling you could sell one whole loofah or you can cut a loofah in half or cut them a couple times and make salt scrubs use them for I use them around the garden as a garden tool to scrub my garden tools you can use them to scrub shoes so there's so many multiple uses so that's a way of making income the also the flowers selling selling fresh flowers from your garden is also i've seen that in farmers markets where people are selling in addition to their produce they're selling flowers as well but to make things profitable you have to look at again your audience and your where you're at for me more products were like our garden sticks with the names of the cucumbers, kale, lettuce, those garden sticks. Those that you made? Yeah. Well, I actually had her, she was in, she lives in Oregon and she is a professional calligraphy writer. And so she designed our garden sticks and they're different types of calligraphy. They have different names on them. And her name is Tatiana, but she's in Oregon and she's handmade these garden sticks. And then we sell the garden sticks and then we have t-shirts, different type of t-shirts. That's income. But what I like most is the online workshops because I get to build a community. I get to answer questions, but I also get to equip our attendees, our viewers with information that really is going to help them be better gardeners or also better small business owners. We will be having an upcoming workshop on how to start your garden business. All right. So can listeners make a living wage doing this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Consulting. We, we consult with So you can do a couple of things. You can just consult somebody. They call you or they make an appointment and say, hey, can you come look at my garden and give me some ideas and tips? I love gardening. 
and I really want to get my hands in. I don't want you to do everything, but can you come and consult with me? So you go and you have a consultation with them, hour and a half. Minimum is what I suggest so they can ask questions and you can answer them. And then you can do a design for them. You can say, all right, we will do custom raised garden beds for you. We'll plant everything. It's a turnkey. Do you want to, some clients want a turnkey. I had a doctor that was out in peril and I had several doctors that side note during the pandemic, we got a lot of clients that were doctors that were installing gardens. It was a most interesting thing. But one of our clients, we he was just a simple turnkey. You do everything and every now and then I'm going to come out and harvest, but I want you to do it. And then you have the clients who want you to do garden maintenance. So it's like, okay, the garden's installed. Thank you for installing the garden. Can you come back once a week or two or three times a week and help us maintenance, water, pest control, pest management? And so co consultations are one, installing gardens are another. Online workshops, great way you have multiple people. You don't have to be in one place. You can have hundreds of people attending these online workshops. And then I like products. I like, I realize I am a brand. And so you will rarely see me without a Let Us Live t-shirt. I always am wearing Let Us Live. But the interesting thing is I, I heard a talk from Lovey. She is a, prof her tagline is a professional tr troublemaker. She said she streamlined her wardrobe. She's like, I, I streamline it and this is all I wear. So I was like, ah, that's genius. This is a few years ago. I'm like I'm streamlining my wardrobe too. Everything is let us live tea. So I'm let us live tea dressed up with heels and some jeans. I'm let us live tea with some casual. I'm let us live tea all the time. And so I realize I'm a brand. And so what happens now is I can be somewhere and somebody says, oh, you're the let us live lady. Oh, I know. Mm -hmm. I recognize that logo. So it's a recognizable brand and logo. So I think branding is really key. It's like, what is your niche going to be? What, how do you want to brand yourself? I like to be casual most of the time. And so t-shirts or tees were it for me. In addition to writing for Mother Earth and doing the podcast, I own a carnivorous plant nursery. So I didn't know this, but I am following your uh, rule a couple years ago. Whenever I'm out in the public, I'm always wearing my t-shirt with a carnivorous plant on it, with a Venus flytrap, a pitcher plant. And people will either recognize me or they'll stop and say, hey, cool t-shirt, is that a flytrap? And then that's my opportunity to hook them and say, yes, yep. it is. And I also happen to sell them. Yep. So, so we want to make, we want to talk about how listeners can make a living wage. And what I, what I think I'm hearing you say is that like education is a great component of how you can get an income. So we don't want the listeners to undersell themselves. And when you are asking for a fee, I know you have to be confident and you also need to know what you're worth. So you can't be caught off guard when someone says, oh, how much is a hour consultation or how much is a half day install? So how would you go about calculating when you're selling vegetables, how do you, or loofahs, how do you calculate that? Or, and how do you calculate how much a consultation is, especially if you're just beginning? So I think we underestimate, I think this is an American thing where we just don't have, we don't understand our value. Just because you're just beginning doesn't mean that you don't have knowledge. So people, when people, people come to you, you have to realize they came to you because they believe you have an answer. If they didn't think you had an answer, they would not have come to you. So I think you have to be confident. It's that saying, fake it till you make it. No, but fake it till you make it, but you have to know what you're talking about as well. And so it's, I, I'm sure you see this, especially with carnivorous plants is People will tell you online, Instagram, and all these 
crazy things to do. Oh, add this, do yeah. this. And I'm like, are you kidding me? That's not true. You can't do that. That doesn't work. It's like that commercial, just because it was on the internet, it's true. People, that is not true. Know what you're talking about and do your research. And one thing that I do know about gardening, if your hands are not in the dirt, you are not learning. You have to have your hands in the dirt. Even when I'm doing primarily like workshops and consultations, I have to have my hands in the dirt to learn different things. For example, yesterday I was out watering some plants and checking on some plants. And I noticed that there were a bunch of caterpillars. I'm like, what the heck is this? Well, what I discovered was they're web worms. There's a pear tree across from where all of my other fruit trees and plants are that has a, a large web around it. And what it is, is that silk web is produced when the larva is eating and feeding like the larva. So they eat and feed and it creates this moth. Well, the moth are leaving that tree and they're coming over to my other tree. But had I not had my hands in the dirt and figured out what, okay, like, like I'm out in the dirt and I used vinegar, hot water and soap and dump. And I was just putting the, the larva or the caterpillars inside of the bucket and they were dying immediately. Prior to me putting them in that mixture, they were just crawling out the bucket. Just They were just going crazy, crawling everywhere. But I did that mixture, vinegar, soap to make it stick to them, and then some hot water. And I've got a bucket full of dead larvae. But, but the, the other thing is, speaking about, like you were saying, sustainability, I think that we have to begin to really kind of close the gap on this ecosystem. Because if I had chickens and I, I am getting chickens, I moved out to the country. And so we're in the process of getting our land ready. But if I had chickens, the chickens would be out there eating those. They would, they'd just be pecking and eating all day long. And so that's how you close the gap and understand it's important that you are constantly learning and saying, how can you contribute to the well-being of the planet, but work less? If you do what is beneficial to the planet, you you weed less because you're covering your soil. I say soil is like your skin. You don't go outside without sunscreen. You don't leave your soil unprotected. So put leaves, pine needles, mulch, whatever you put on there, keep your soil covered. Then you don't have to pick weeds as much. But does that help the soil? Yes, because you're not ne needing as much water. You, you're retaining your water and moisture in the soil. You're keeping the beneficial bugs happy. I mean, it's just a happy ecosystem that we all could play a part in. I think. Did I answer your question? I just went on. A Karina, we've digressed quite a bit, but I've been, I enjoyed everything you said. And I wrote down some notes. But first, I want to go back. How do you calculate how much a loofah is, how much your vegetables are, or how much a consultation is. Because I'm thinking if you're a new person and you're like, hey, I want to monetize, I want to make some money gardening, you're going to try to compare rates of Correct. people in your area. But there might not be anybody in your area. So oftentimes, like when I'm doing a farmer's market or doing a market and I'm selling produce, or if I'm selling produce like garden boxes, what I do is I check a couple of the grocery store prices and see what they're selling organic vegetables. And I'm always going to check the high-end grocery stores, check what their price is for organic vegetables. And I always sell higher than that. I don't sell equal. Why? Because I have a better product than what they have in the grocery store. Why? Because I just harvest it. It's full of nutrients. It has we know 1000% sure that it has no pesticides in it. It wasn't trucked in. So I always charge higher than what the high-end organic store is. So that's where I would start on produce. As far as consultations, I think with everything, you have to do market research and find what people are charging in your area. 
And if there's no one in your area, which would be hard to believe in this day and age, but if there's no one in your area, look outside, look at the next city, the next town and figure out what they are charging and then get somewhere in the ballpark. Do not shortchange yourself. And if somebody's saying, I'm charging $500, say, well, I'm new. I'm just going to charge $250 or $150. Don't do it. If people are willing to fight, pay 500, let them pay 500. Here's the other most important thing that I would tell anybody that's starting a business or starting in this arena. They don't know what you know until you tell them. So until you say, oh, I don't have that much experience, they start <laughs> questioning, your, well, should I be hiring you? What You don't know anything. They don't know what you don't know. And I can guarantee you, you know more than them, and that's why they called you. So don't start the conversation out with a defeated attitude that you don't have the experience because they only know what you tell them. Very good tip. So I do not consult, but I do presentations around the state of Florida on carnivorous plants and how to grow them. And I do have a speaking fee, but because I'm traveling all over the state, so that could be up to like six hours one way. I started um, charging $50 an hour of driving. That's on top of the presentation. Yes. And in this past, you know, spring quarter, 19 out of the 20 people who contacted me said, okay, we get it. And then one garden club said, you know, we usually don't pay the speaker if they're going to sell you know, books and plants. And I said, okay, well, then I'm not coming because I can't give up six hours without knowing if I'm going to make money or not. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's very true. And I'm glad you mentioned that because here's the other thing. When you're starting a new, new business, don't be afraid to say no. Don't say yes in the name of make, in the name of losing money. Because in your case, if you're driving six hours, you're losing money. I don't know about you, but when I leave my house, you can guarantee it's a hundred dollars just to walk outside from gas to buying something to eat, whatever you, so you do bet you'd be better off sitting at home, not losing any money than driving somewhere and not making any money. The other thing is even if you're not making money, let's say they say we're, we can't pay you, but is there some way to negotiate something else from, and this happens for speaking, not for consultation, but speaking definitely. Can I do this instead to kind of make money? But with consultations, I'm going to tell you, if they're not willing to pay you the industry standard, I have found that people that want to want me to go down on my prices, don't want to pay what I've asked, they are the most difficult customers that you have. And you, you always end up saying, I shouldn't have taken this client. I, I, I should have said no. They are going to haggle you down. The other thing about starting out low, it's very difficult to bring customers up. Start out where you want to be and then maybe go down a little bit. But let me tell you something. If you start off very, very low, it is going to be impossible to get the customers up to what industry standard is. And I'm going to tell you this from personal experience. I recently just lost a client because of that. And I'm okay with it because it's hot. The sun is brutal. Hey, I'd rather be at home in my air condition than being somewhere where I'm not going to be paid my worth. So we mentioned that farmer's market aren't really the best way to monetize a small scale operation. And we talked about merchandise, t-shirts and garden sleeves. And then we also talked about those garden sticks. And then of course the education component, which is consultation. Would you say that the education component is the biggest money maker? Well, for me, and that is simply because I don't push the t-shirts enough because I'm busy doing the other things, but I do plan on putting more attention on t-shirts. People are buying t-shirts a lot. It's it, We are in an 
in an, in an age where casual is the thing. Most of us are casual most of the time. And so the t-shirts aren't as lucrative just because I'm not putting the time behind it, but they can be, they can be. I, I think our t-shirts are $34, $34.99 or something like that. So they can be. Are we combining the education component of consultation and installation, or would you consider those two separate things of installing a garden for someone? So most of the time, I'm going to do a consultation first. And let me tell you why I do the consultation first. So if I come out there, I give you some advice, and you decide not to hire me, I'm not bitter because you paid for my time. When you start out, the game is not giving all of your information away. Don't give them the whole bank. Don't give them everything that you've learned over the last five or 10 years, because it's like, why hire you? You just gave me everything. So you really have to be careful on the consultation, doing a time, making sure you stop at the time you said you, if you're giving them an hour and a half or an hour, stop at the hour, an hour and a half and do not give them too much. Now, the way I get my consultations is I give a free 15 minute consultation. And I'm going to tell you, when I first started, 15 would turn into 20, 20 would turn into 30. And I was giving away all the goods. It needs and to be a hard like, oh, cutoff. It has to be a hard cutoff. And you have to be intentional about what you'll give away. Don't give away the answer. Give away an idea. Don't give them the solution. Because if you keep giving them the solution, I, I, don't, I can Google the rest. I don't need to hire you. I can figure it out or do it myself. So the benefit of me doing these presentations and the benefit of you doing those free 15-minute consultations is that you can and should just be repeating for each new client, right? Of course, you want to customize it, you know, based on the location and the personality, but don't be giving one person 15 minutes of information and then redoing the whole presentation for the next person. Right. It's the same information. It's the same basic information. And if they begin to ask, if the 15 minutes tries to turn into a consultation, you have to pay attention to that. And again, somebody that's trying to get something for nothing is not really the ideal client that you want to work with. Those, those consultations, if you give somebody a free 15 minute consultation and they don't at least book in-person consultation or something else, it's just going to be hard to get money for them. And you, what you don't want to do is struggle to convert a client. But people, my coach said this, people that are for you, that know your voice, that want to work with you, your clients are your clients. You, you don't have to do a lot of negotiating and fighting and trying to sell them. They do want to know that you're going to be an answer to their problem. They do want to know that you're going to deliver on all your promises. I'm not saying that. But the people that are for you and want to work with you, they want to work with you. It's not a whole lot of selling. You, They just need to know that you're competent and you're going to deliver. So Karina, do you think that listeners should do this full-time or would they be successful doing this as a side hustle? So that's twofold. If you want to do it full-time, I believe that you can. The industry is there. More and more people are becoming very sensitive to the types of foods that they're, they're foods that they're eating, but they're also becoming more conscious about what they're feeding their families. More and more people are wanting to at least know how to grow their own food. So I think there is an opportunity to do it full time. Now, would I say quit your day job today and start it tomorrow? No, but I think that you can do it part time and invest in your business. And then over time, develop a framework that where you're building your business up, then yes, I think you can. If there are people doing it all over the world. I'm doing it. I, so yes, you can make a living and you get to meet wonderful people and organizations like Mother Earth. I love being a part of their speaking tour. I love being on podcasts and these opportunities to be showcased. You meet other really cool people. There are so many awesome 
some people a part of our 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 tour now, our initiative, the Mother Earth Initiative. Now, it, so it is an opportunity to meet people. But yes, I I think that you can eventually do it full time and make a living off of it. You also need to pay attention to your area. What's the need there? And then set your goals and intentions. Like, do you want to do this full time? If it is something you want to do full time, start taking in the steps to make it happen you know start your business name start getting the word out and in the beginning you may have to do some free somewhat free things to get testimony so it's okay you do this for free but in return i need you to refer three customers or i'll do this for free i need you to write a testimony or record a video get something in exchange for when you do it free. Oh, really important tip. Anytime you give somebody something for free, send them an invoice, put what you would charge for it and zero it out so that they can understand the value that you've given them. Never give anybody something for free and don't give them an invoice. They need to know, yeah, it was free to you, but it cost me this much. Well, thank you so much, Karina, for speaking with us today. Our conversation on monetizing small-scale gardening operations has been very insightful, and this podcast specifically has been jam-packed with tips. So thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoyed it. And we thank you, the listener, for joining our podcast and encourage you to share it with your friends, colleagues, and family. To listen to more podcasts and to learn more, visit our website, MotherEarthNews.com. You can also follow our social media platforms from that link and ask questions for future podcasts. And remember, no matter how brown your thumb is, you can always cultivate kindness. You've just heard our episode about monetizing small-scale garden operations with Karina Polk. You can reach us at podcast at ogdenpubs.com with any comments or suggestions. Our podcast production team includes Jessica Mitchell, John Moore, and Kenny Coogan. Music for this episode is Travel Light by Jason Shaw. This Mother Earth News and Friends podcast is a production of Ogden Publications. Learn more about us at MotherEarthNews.com. We'd like to thank Sunglow Greenhouses one more time for sponsoring this episode. A Sunglow Greenhouse makes gardening a year-round moneymaker. A Sunglow investment will keep your plants away from pests, harsh weather, and extreme cold and hot temperatures all year. That's why their customers consider their pricing a small amount to pay for a lifetime of returns. Sunglow is the only residential greenhouse using a geothermal heating system called GAT Light. The GAT system naturally warms the raised beds for superior plant growth and a much lower greenhouse heating bill. There truly is only one way to garden in all four seasons, the Sunglow way. Check them out at sunglowgreenhouses.com. That's S-U-N-G-L-O greenhouses.com. Until next time, don't forget to love your mother.